Who here remembers Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus? That was such an amazing show. And honestly, she was the teacher that we all wished we had. But even Miss Frizzle would be ready to throw in the towel if she had to be in one of these modern day classrooms. On the daily, teachers are getting cussed out, spit on, hit, flipped off. Their equipment is getting broken and stolen. There are bullies in class that are relentless, not just to their own fellow students, but to the adult in the room. Teachers are mistreated by students, they're overworked and they're underpaid, and it's leading to a serious shortage of teachers. So let's dive into why so many of our modern day frizzles are calling it quits. What's up YouTube, it's Tiny C and welcome to my digital garden. <laughs> So it turns out a lot of teachers are just done and I'm talking like out the door done and I can't even blame them. Through the research I've been doing for this video, I'm realizing how unappreciated the teaching profession is. They're basically dodging desks and chairs from the students in the classroom and then they have to go and deal with their out of touch parents who definitely don't help the situation. I have also worked as an after school teacher myself and have since left that field. And let me tell you, I've seen some things, I've dealt with some things, and I completely can empathize with what a lot of these teachers are saying. It's tough out there for teachers. They're constantly giving, sticking their neck out to protect their students, only to get mistreated in return. And speaking of protection, there's another way we can protect ourselves, and that's with online security. And that's where today's sponsor, Surfshark, comes in. Just like teachers need support in the classroom, we all need protection online. The internet can be a risky place. Hackers, data thieves, and nosy ISPs are just waiting for a chance to grab your personal information. But with Surfshark, you can browse safely knowing your data is encrypted and secure. It's like having a shield that keeps the bad guys out. Another cool way I like to use Surfshark is for streaming. I don't know about you, but I love me some anime and Ghibli movies. And unfortunately, they're not always available in my region. But never fear, because Surfshark takes care of that by letting you access shows and movies from around the world. It's kind of like getting a free pass to any content you want, no matter where you are. But wait, there's more. They also have Surfshark Antivirus, which protects your devices from viruses, malware, and other digital threats. Think of it as your personal bodyguard, but for your tech. So if you're ready to step up your online security game, check out Surfshark. They have 30 day money back guarantee. So click the link in my description and use my code TINYC at checkout to get an extra four months free on top of your subscription. Happy surfing and thank you to our sponsor, Surfshark. So let's talk about what it's like to be a teacher nowadays. A lot of people assume that teachers have an easy job because they get the summer off. They're off by 315. The students give them gifts. The teaching profession is no longer what it used to be even back when I was in school. A lot of these students are getting very rude and it's getting a bit grim. We've seen a substantial increase in the amount of vacancies since the pandemic. So let's look at a little bit of data. So on this website, Edweek, I saw that in Florida, they had 4,000 vacancies last year and now they have 5,000 vacancies. So it went up by 1,000. And they're not really sure if it's because of turnover rate or if it's just because they aren't able to fill these positions in the first place. But it's honestly not the same everywhere. It varies from state to state and district to district. Something really interesting that this website points out is right over here. Teachers enroll into these teacher prep programs and this is something that they're required to complete if they want to get their teaching credential. And although they saw a decrease, it used to be an average of about 700,000. Now they see that it's at 600,000 prospective teachers each year. But the crazy part is that only 159,000 of them are actually completing these courses in the first place. So they aren't able to output the amount of teachers necessary to even fill some of these positions in the first place. And this is probably also contributing to the shortage in a lot of these areas, a lot of these states and districts. But what's really even deterring these teachers from the teaching profession in the first place? What's making them quit? One of the biggest things that we are seeing called out from these teachers is the behavior of these students. And that seems to be the number one issue that is causing them to quit. Sometimes in the middle of lessons, in the middle of teaching, they're just done. They're over it. I'm walking right out the door. I won't ever be back. 
some of these teachers are even saying that it's causing them trauma like they are waking up in the middle of the night with nightmares and no one wants to be in a profession that's causing them night terrors i made the decision not to return to the classroom this year and i haven't been in a classroom for months now and i still have nightmares trauma nightmares on a weekly basis about my former classroom and my former student. That's horrible. I would leave too. <laughs> Actually, I left. I, I did leave. So let's watch this video about a teacher of five years that decided that she is done. Those of you who are not in education are aware of what's happening in schools, but it it's not easy. I don't I don't think people truly understand what teachers are going through. Lots of children are, are not told no at home, which makes my job extremely difficult when it comes to having them hold accountability for their actions and their mistakes and following directions and keeping their hands to themselves. And this is a reoccurring thing that I've been seeing in a lot of the videos that I'm going to show. They often talk about how these students are not being taught properly at home. And no is like the most basic thing. If they don't even understand no, if they don't know that basic boundary, how is a teacher supposed to do their job? How are they supposed to establish any boundaries with the kids? It's impossible, essentially. It's not possible. This year, I have been cursed at by both students and parents. I have been hit, punched, repeatedly punched repeatedly is just like absolutely crazy because that's where i'm pretty sure a lot of people would draw the line when it becomes physical and the fact that she says hit punched multiple times this is not a one-off occurrence and when it gets to the point that your students are putting hands on you i imagine that that's definitely when you start to think that maybe this isn't for you i never got hit or punched when i was an after school teacher, but the verbal abuse was enough for me to want to quit. And so I can only imagine if I was also getting hit, like that would have been the last day. Definitely giving resignation on the table that day. And the fact that students feel comfortable to do that and interact in that way with their teachers nowadays, it doesn't really make any sense. And it, it does break my heart that I am walking away for something that I went to school with and had so much passion for, but that passion is gone. I parent more than I do teach. I'm gonna leave that at that. And that's like a big point that I parent more than I do teach. That's not a teacher's job. They're not supposed to be parents. Their job is to educate the students. And so if they're also having to be a parent, AKA teach them boundaries, teach them no, teach them basic discipline and behaviors, then that takes away time from them actually being able to teach them to read, teach them math. It's just sad that teachers like this who have been in the field for five years, who were passionate, probably at one point really was excited to do this, that they have to walk away because of the way that students are behaving, parents are behaving, and sometimes even the school. That brings me to the next video that I found, which was around how the school behaves when certain behaviors are going on. And it feels like they don't even care. <laughs> And this is one of the reasons why I quit. After a degree, after clinicals, after five years of teaching, one of those reasons is why I quit. And what had happened was I had a difficult student who he would come in high, he would sleep all class, period. Wrote him up, wrote him up, wrote him up. Admin did absolutely nothing. To a point to where some admin were deleting my referrals, deleting them. I would go back in and they would be gone for multiple students. And my last straw was the same kid. Um, we were about to read. Uh, the audio was for 10 minutes and 16 seconds. 10 minutes and 16 seconds, I was asking students to put their phone away. And I kept asking him and he wouldn't oblige. And he turns around to me and he says, you annoying as fuck. That day I put in all my sick time. I put my two weeks in. I walked out. I ain't been back since. My stuff's still sitting in that desk. Y'all can kiss my ass. It's, it's a crazy story because she's actively being sabotaged. She's trying to ask for this admin support, right? Maybe suspension, whatever it is, for them to help her 
discipline her students and they would rather sabotage her. And this is something that I saw in multiple videos. And the reason that I found that they do this from some articles that I read was because they want to make sure that their school looks good. And so the less, I guess, demerits or I don't know what people do nowadays, but whatever she meant by I would send referrals in, I'm guessing it's like demerits or, or how many kids are getting suspended. They'd rather there be less of that so that their school looks good. And when the authority figure in the room is allowed to be disrespected, that just caused a chain reaction. And now they know that they can walk all over this teacher. What's happening to the education system that they would rather care about how it looks on the outside rather than care about their employees, which is honestly the reason why the school's even functioning in the first place. And another huge theme that we're seeing is that students are getting violent. We already touched on it with that other teacher that quit after five years, but students are assaulting their teachers. They are hitting their teachers and it's not okay. My first year teaching was, I came in in the middle of the school year as a long-term sub and my kids had hit their teacher in the face with a stapler and she walked out. It was her first year teaching and she quit at the beginning of October. So she made it August, September. She quit at the beginning of October. In August, somebody got the fight and she tried to break it up. They pushed her into the Promethean board, broke the board. And then in September, somebody threw a stapler across the room and hit her in the face. And so she she didn't come back. And I'm like, I, I can't blame you. But the first conversation that I had when I got it, don't throw nothing across this room. Because the teacher y'all had ain't the teacher you got right now. Don't Nothing better not hit me in the face. They wouldn't even me. I didn't ask. The first person to say that wasn't me, it was you. Throwing a stapler at a teacher is crazy. And I don't know how this sort of behavior is allowed, but I completely understand why this causes teachers to quit. She was only there for two months and it sounded like there was multiple occurrences of violence against her. Honestly, kudos to her for lasting more than one occurrence. These people are actually really passionate about this. They want to help these students. They want to be teachers. It seems as though these students are allowed to come back into the classroom and repeat these behaviors over and over because administration doesn't want to do anything too severe, doesn't want to kick them out, recommend them to maybe a different, more strict school. Like they don't want to do these things for, I guess, public reasons. They don't want their school to look bad. But again, it's on the shoulders of these teachers. And something that we're also seeing is Gen Alpha specifically being called out. I know that Gen Z, some of the younger Gen Z are still in school, but something that we're definitely seeing a rise in is Gen Alpha getting called out for so many things, their reading ability, them being on the internet, them being into skincare too young. There's a lot of concerning things that are starting to happen with this generation, especially their behaviors in the classroom. Some teachers talk about how working with Gen Alpha was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the reason that they decided I'm quitting. So let's see some of the concerning things Gen Alpha specifically is doing in the classroom. I've been teaching for like 10 years. I've been in the game for 10 years. And before that I was a teaching assistant. So I've been in it even longer than 10 years. One thing that I'm noticing, this generation alpha, bloody hell, they are a piece of work. And I'm seeing some teachers in America saying this, but so I work in year two and oh my God, I feel victimized by some of these six and seven year olds. Like they don't listen, they're violent as hell. Their academic abilities are so much lower than I've seen in my previous um, teaching years. They're helpless. You ask a question, they're just staring at you. They still can't form their letters. Like before, in a class of 30, you might have had maybe five or six students that you know needed support to access the curriculum. Now it's like the other way around. You have five or six students that can access the curriculum and then the rest of the class really struggles. One thing that's really catching my attention is that a lot of them need help. They're helpless. Like that's the first time I heard that word come up, helpless. Like they just stare at you when you ask them a question. I must know your name. My name? Yes, your name, son. Uh, Beef Wellington? Uh, no, your name. Ah, uh, uh, the fork on the left? <laughs> Stop joking. Tell him your name. My name? What's his name? What's his name? I got nothing on a name. Come on, baby, what's the name? <laughs> <laughs> 
there's probably a lot of reasons that students aren't performing at the grade level that they should be. It could be because their parents aren't checking their work when they get home. They might not be actively interested in where their students are. Personally, I was doing so much outside of school to make sure that I was at my grade level. I was constantly reviewing my times table. Because school and learning is where it's at. You gotta listen and study and do your part so you can get off to a real good start. You need a good start in this world today. You gotta exercise your mind and that's okay. Turn the TV up and the videos too. Your mind is where it's at and it's up to you. Oh, rapping with the I did all of those hooked on phonics type things, like a bunch of educational games. Do parents still do that sort of thing with their children? Because it helped me. These are the sorts of things that parents have to be doing. But also if teachers aren't able to spend most of the time teaching, whether that's because they're reprimanding other students or just because they have to constantly help people get up to speed, it takes time away from getting them to where they need to be. They're perpetually trying to catch up and it's just like impossible. A lot of people also blame it on the fact that they're addicted to technology, they're iPad kids as they say, and potentially kids being too addicted to these technologies and the parents not stepping in to restrict the amount of time that they have access to this, this can lead to their grades suffering. I won't say that technology is the only reason their grades are bad because I mean, we also had video games. We also loved to play. In the end of the day, I'll chalk it up to my parents and other people's parents being more active in their kids' education and making sure that they were actually learning, completing their work, and limiting the amount of time that you had to play and also be on the game or be on the computer. And so something that we're seeing is illustrated really well in this report. And so this is nces.ed.gov. They found that the average reading scores were 220 and 263 for fourth and eighth grade students, respectively. So it feels like that's very close in, in scoring for a, eighth, a fourth grader and an eighth grader. It's almost at the same level. So it's also saying in 2019, some 35% of fourth grade students and 34% of eighth grade students performed at or above NAEP proficient. Not even half of them are performing at or above. Not even 50, that's crazy. So they break it up by poverty level, English language learner status, um, and of course this affects their scoring. If they're higher poverty schools, then they have even lower scores. Difference is not that much. And probably because of the teaching shortage among a whole plethora of other factors, these students are just falling through the cracks and it's not getting any better for them. And this teacher also went viral talking about how his students were not reading at the grade level or just performing in general at the grade level that they should be. I'm not even trying to be funny, but these kids are, I'm gonna just say this. I teach seventh grade, they are still performing on the fourth grade level. I don't care how you flip it, turn it, swing it, swing it, swindle it. They still performing on a fourth grade level. Ain't nobody talking about how they just keep moving, passing them on. They just keep passing them on, 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 passing them on. I can put as many zeros in this grade book as I want to. They're gonna move that child to the eighth grade next year. But ain't nobody talking about that. And so he's illustrating the fact that it's also the schools. It's partly on the school's responsibility that they're passing these children onto the next grade level, even if they're being failed. Being held back was 100% a thing. If you were not reading at your level, you would be held back or you'd be moved into another classroom to where they can teach you at a slower rate. But if they are no longer using those methods to make sure that you're up to speed, then yeah, you're gonna be in seventh grade reading at a fourth grade level because your parents haven't intervened, the school's not intervening anymore for whatever reason, maybe too many parents complained, but now here we are. A point that we're really seeing brought up and brought up and brought up is the parents. And I think it's because that's really what it boils down to. What is happening at home that this is being allowed? So one thing that a lot of people bring up is the whole gentle parenting thing. So I looked into it to really figure out what this is all about. 
this is essentially what is gentle parenting. And according to parents.com, patient, calm, and punishment-free, gentle parenting is an evidence-based approach that focuses on empathy, respect, understanding, and boundaries. And so according to some people in comment sections, they were like, parent, gentle parenting and permissive parenting is being mixed up. According to parents.com, it says punishment free. Okay. So gentle parenting is a means of parenting without shame, blame, or punishment. It's centered on partnership as both parents and children have a say in this collaborative style. Gentle parenting is as it sounds. It is a softer, gentler approach to parenting and parents and caregivers that practice gentle parenting do so by guiding their children with consistent, compassionate boundaries, not a firm hand. It's a collaboration between the parents and the children. And it feels as though there are a lot of benefits and I see how this can be something really good to teach them that they have their own say and so on and so forth. I think the reason why people are maybe pointing to gentle parenting when it comes to the classroom is that again, there's no punishment and there's no hard boundaries. But unfortunately in the world, there are punishments, there are boundaries, there are things that aren't going to go our way. And a teacher has to do these things in order for the classroom to run. You can't talk back. This isn't a collaboration, right? This is the teacher doing their job, which is educating children and the students behaving and being respectful and allowing the teacher to do the job. That's it. There's no tantrum. There's no, I don't feel like learning English. We're learning English. We're in English period. Like that's it. That's all. I think some of these parents just aren't active in their children's lives. They're not paying attention to their education. But then again, they're also not disciplining them or setting any boundaries. But then when the teacher comes up to them and tells them, oh, your kid did this, that, and the third, they can't be bothered to hold their kids accountable. So I think a lot of the problems do start at home. The parents honestly have a lot to play in the way that teachers end up quitting because it's their kids that have a direct effect on that teacher running out, that teacher deciding that this profession isn't for them. I do think they have a responsibility to make sure that their kids are prepared for what it means to respect your teacher. What is being done to help these teachers? Right now we're seeing that they're filling a lot of these jobs with underqualified teachers. It's just teachers that shouldn't really be working that job and they end up having to work it because they don't have enough qualified candidates applying for the position. And so we're also seeing that a lot of these issues vary from state to state. Some of the states with the highest vacancies are Florida, Illinois, and Arizona. And the states with lower vacancies are Utah, Missouri, and Nebraska. And so let's see what Florida's doing to remedy the situation. In a bid to combat the shortage, some school districts in Florida are offering salary increases, signing bonuses, and mentoring programs for new teachers. The state also supports alternative teacher certification programs that get qualified professionals into classrooms quickly. They're giving them more pay, they're giving them these signing bonuses, but sometimes the pay is not enough. And also since a lot of these schools are ran by the state, there's only so much that the school is able to give them. And some other articles I've read that they're also running out of some of the money that they are using to give these teachers bonuses and compared to a doctor who again has a high stress job and they're getting paid six figures that's kind of what keeps them there. And teachers make around 66,000 on average. And that's on the higher end. On the lower end, they're making 44,000. A lot of times they're not making enough to live, to buy a house, to buy groceries, to take care of themselves and their families. So I don't know if this incentive is going to be enough. And Texas is doing something really interesting. They have a teacher home buyer incentive program to retain educators. They are essentially giving a down payment assistance or a forgivable loan to first time home buyer teachers in exchange for a commitment to work in a public school district for a certain period. This also seems like something that they do um, like in certain areas where teachers don't wanna work they will incentivize you by giving you like a huge bonus, but you have to commit a certain amount of time to that district. And so with this home buyer thing, it's the same type of deal going on. It's like, okay, we'll give you this potentially free down payment, but now you have to stay here. So you could be getting hit, bit, staplers, knocked out. You'd like, <laughs> 
abused and you're gonna have to stay because you took this money. But that's not addressing the issues in the classroom that's going on with the behavior of these students, as well as the parents not taking responsibility, the school not taking responsibility to help these teachers. And so these issues are still persisting. I don't think throwing money or making teachers speed through schooling is really the answer. It's putting a Band-Aid over a much deeper issue. That's pretty much what we're seeing with the whole teaching situation in schools. It looks very grim. It's very sad to see that teachers are being so disrespected and that kids are just so unruly and feel so comfortable disrespecting authority figures. And although they're trying to do things, I think a lot of it falls on the parents' shoulders because a lot of the reasons these teachers quit is because of the kids' behavior. So it's on parents to make sure that they're teaching their kids proper manners, discipline. If that can happen, then we can get back to actually educating instead of teachers having to parent in the classroom and taking up all the time doing that. It goes down to the federal as well as the state government to make sure that something is put in place so that these teachers just feel more comfortable and like they're valued. They are the backbone. They're right up there with the doctors. They're right up there with the nurses. They have a very important job and you can't really live without teachers. Tell me what you guys think in the comment section. If you made it this far in the video, drop a apple emoji so I can see that you guys made it. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.